Thank you for joining uh, on this webcast. I'm Roman Sherbakov from CLA. Um, just before we start, a uh, couple of housekeeping comments and we'll make an introduction. So from housekeeping throughout the presentation, you will have um, some pop-ups for the polling questions. Please answer um, if we'd like to receive the CPE credit. Um, and there is a box for questions. Please submit them and we will respond to them. Um, we'll try to restart to respond to them during the presentation. Also, um, just uh, to mention that next um, webcast, FEI's webcast will be on September 16th, um, and the topic will be in the park library, history and renovation. We try to do it uh, in person in the spring, but for uh, because of COVID, it has been postponed, so we're going online. Uh, look for more official invitation and hopefully you will be able to join. So now we turn uh, to our topic, the, fu uh, the future of working remotely. And I would like to introduce uh, two of our speakers, uh, Mike Volk uh, from PSA. So uh, as the leader of PSA cybersecurity risk solutions in um, emerging task practice area, Mike Volk is responsible for helping clients make informative decisions about technology and cybersecurity insurance and develop strategies to reduce cybersecurity risk. Uh, for the past uh, 10 years, Mike has worked in many, many roles uh, where he helped organizations and individuals navigate the complex cybersecurity landscape. Mike is engaged in the cybersecurity community and currently serves on the board of directors of Cybersecurity Association of Maryland. Phil Delbello, so Phil, is in the CLA Specialized Advisory Services Risk Management Group. Uh, Phil has over a decade of experience providing IT security assurance, consulting, uh, and advisory services. Throughout his career, Phil has been the lead project manager for many IT and security audits and risk assessments. He helps clients with a variety of security compliance issues. So with that, I will turn uh, the microphone to to Mike. All right, Roman, thank you for that introduction. Uh, really appreciate it. Uh, so before we jump in, we want to quickly run through what we're going to cover today. Uh, so we're going to start with what's the same. And we know that a lot has changed with COVID, uh, but a lot of the things we're dealing with have actually stayed the same. Uh, then we're going to focus on what's changed, what, it, what has changed uh, because of COVID, COVID and what, what's going to stick around with us uh, after things hopefully get back to normal. Uh, we want to touch on how uh, you should manage cyber risk in this environment. And then we want to close with some things that you can, you can focus on right now to make improvements. So what's the same? So when we, uh, we sat down to come up with this presentation, uh, clearly COVID and uh, the issues that we're all dealing with working remotely uh, were at the top of our mind. But as we started talking through the details, we realized that there's a, there's a lot that we're dealing with now uh, that we were dealing with before. Uh, and the other piece is uh, that never changes and it's been consistent enough for Phil and I uh, through our careers, cyber risk management is, is critical. Um, and I think it's only becoming more important as we've become more heavily reliant on technology. So what's the same? So the first thing that we, we notice is that the threat actors that we're dealing with, uh, for the most part, especially in the small and medium sized business space, uh, are the same. Uh, the other thing that I've noticed is the imagery in cybersecurity always stays the same. You get the, the hacker in the hoodie, uh, in the shadows, uh, doing the nefarious things on a computer, uh, which, which is true. I mean, hacking happens and, it, and it's going to continue to happen. Um, but the things that uh, most businesses that we work with deal with uh, are a lot less, uh, 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 I guess, romantic and romanticized than that. Uh, most of them are criminals that are financially motivated, that probably aren't sitting in a dark room wearing a hoodie. Uh, they're, at, they're using technology uh, to make their criminal activity more efficient. Prominent attacks that we see today uh, are, are lucrative for cyber criminals because it works and it's really hard to get caught. Um, and the other piece is that, that a lot of the things that they're doing, which we'll get into in a bit, work around our traditional defenses. As I mentioned, hacking is still a major factor uh, it will continue to be a major factor, uh, but many of the small and medium-sized businesses are facing 
uh, less sophisticated attacks that leverage a lot of known vulnerabilities or known exploits uh, that are used by cyber criminals because they know that the small and medium sized businesses uh, aren't as up to date as they probably should be. Uh, and the final thing that's that's really hasn't changed and even before cyber risk, uh, fraudsters uh, leverage fear, uncertainty, and, and our blind spots as humans to trick us. So whether it's a con artist or somebody using uh, the phishing attacks uh, to trick somebody into to divulging information or, or uh, parting with their money, um, uh, the criminal activity here is really uh, the same as it's, it's always been. Uh, it's just, again, makes it just a lot easier for these uh, criminals to succeed because technology makes it so much more efficient. And we figured we would jump right in uh, and hit you guys with a, a polling question on the first slide here. So that should pop up in a second. Give you a few seconds to respond. And this is one social engineering attacks are just becoming so prominent. It's just, it's, it's hard to stay ahead of it. All right, so I'll keep going. I think it's still up here, but you can, you can enter your responses. Um, go ahead and move to the next slide here. Looks like it's at the end. All right. All right. Okay. Um, so the, the threat actors are, are relatively similar to what we've been dealing with. Um, the next thing we want to talk about is the threat landscape. What are the, what are the things that those threat actors are using um, to, to attack their targets? And, and with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Phil to talk through uh, what the threat landscape looks like and, and kind of how it, it looks today versus uh, what it's looking like going forward. Thanks, Mike. Uh, yeah, I think with that polling question, um, you can see we kind of start at the bottom there with the red box. Uh, phishing, social engineering is still the number one uh, common threat uh, action. You know, it's, it's kind of the starting point for a lot of these issues that arise and the, the threats that arise, um, but it's the number one um, threat that's out there right now. Um, I think if you look at, uh, so the top left box there, credential theft, We'll get into each of these in some more detail, but this one um, actually is on the rise and is up to the number two on the list. Um, it's kind of because of the, the ability for people to create more sophisticated attacks. Um, once they do get credentials, they're not just sending out um, thousands and thousands of emails with uh, a link and hoping one person downloads it. Um, they're adapting and becoming a little bit more sophisticated and using those credentials and getting in and learning a little bit more before they actually initiate their attack. Um, ransomware, not uh, new. You know, you can see kind of the stats here, looking back five years um, or four years, 2016. Um, but it is kind of important to note here and see you know, it's gone up almost 100% the demand for ransom. Um, I think when it kind of first came out, they were uh, maybe not necessarily larger criminal organizations that were using it. Um, and now it's becoming uh, extremely common. And I mean, we've got clients almost every month that we hear that they had a ransomware attack or had a, a ransom issue, um, hopefully that they were able to resolve. But the average demand in 2020 being over $100,000 right now is pretty crazy to see from where it was four years ago. Um, all types of data are being compromised. You know. I, don't think these uh, percentages add up to 100, but you can see the uh, personal information, payment information, all that type of data is you know, valuable in addition to what attackers are doing with ransomware trying just to get you to pay. Um, and then we also wanted to add on here uh, the regulatory and compliance landscape. So this is a, an evolving landscape and it seems like every day there's more and more um, requirements for compliance with these regulatory um, agencies, you know, whether it be states or governments or, um, you know, PCI or HIPAA. Um, and that is, you know, not necessarily a threat per se, but I think for a lot of our um, organizations that we work with, small, medium-sized businesses, 
they have one IT person, one security person who's responsible for managing security. Uh, maybe there's a handful, but even still, typically one person for security. And when they have to comply with these, uh, you know, 100 page documents like uh, California Consumer Pro uh, Protection Act, it, it can kind of take away from actual security processes and monitoring and uh, making sure that organizations are secure. Um, so it is kind of a little bit of a threat when they have to wear so many different hats to be an IT person, a security person, and a compliance person. Um, you know, so some of them are have good information and good practices for maintaining security, um, but it becomes a little bit of a threat as well when you think about um, having to implement everything to meet those requirements if you are just a one-person IT shop and you know, don't have all the resources in place to um, dedicate somebody to that as a full-time position. Um, I think that's it. Mike, you want to jump to the next slide? That worked. All right, so we're gonna dive into everything kind of on the previous slide here in a little bit more detail, but I wanted to definitely touch on credential theft and business email compromise. Um, email, obviously a tool used by every company, um, every industry, uh, no matter what, pretty much. And it is a risk these days because of the amount of email phishing that's being done. The credential theft and email compromise is really just another form of phishing where they're not sending you a um, malicious software like a virus or a ransomware. They're trying to get you to input your username and password or you know, reset your password or something like that so that they can steal your information and then go in and log into your account um, after the fact. Um, it's very easy to set up these web pages that look, you know, this example here, it's a uh, Office 365. Um, you can literally just go on any website, right click, save it, download all the images, all the source code for it, go to a GoDaddy page and upload it all. There's no, uh, you know, uh, copyright, um, you know, people reviewing for copyright on websites similar to printed materials or anything like that. So um, yeah, maybe eventually they'll find it, but you can have a website up there and have all that information copied very easily and very quickly. Um, so it's, it's become uh, very common. And once they do get your information, um, able to log back into the account. I think with you know, how sophisticated these are coming, it's almost very difficult to even be able to tell the difference sometimes between the, the web pages and the URLs. Um, we've seen some examples where uh, the, the link will require you to log in. Once you type your username and password, it will redirect you to the actual Office 365 page. And um, it'll be a, a page that displays and maybe they have a script that runs and tries to put some credentials in. So when the page loads, it says, you know, username and password incorrect, please re-enter. When you re-enter the second time, you get in and you don't even know that anything happened, that uh, you just gave your information away to a malicious attacker. So they're getting very sophisticated and using that information um, to get into your emails. Um, you know, we've, I've had a, a client where this kind of situation happened. They had a attacker get into their email um, they were monitoring the emails, you know, over a period of time and, and saw that um, a, one of their vendors uh, sent an invoice for over a million dollar payment that our client was, um, you know, supposed to pay them for services. And they were kind of tracking and seeing how frequently they were making payments and they were doing it once a month. So right before the payments went out, you know, they saw that invoice and they, right before the payments went out, like a day before, the um, attacker spoofed an email from the vendor, sent in a request to change the account. And the, uh, the client that we have updated the account and sent the payment of over a million dollars to this attacker, which was not their vendor, and all because their email was compromised and they were able to learn like that. So not just putting software on computers anymore through viruses or anything like that, it's getting very sophisticated. Um, all right, ransomware, also not new, but uh, becoming very common. Um, ransomware is kind of the, uh, you know, a low risk, high reward type of attack that these uh, attackers are using because if they can get the, you know, the encryption onto the computer, it will lock up all the information 
uh, more block applications from running um, and typically display something like you see on the right here. Um, there's, you know, since 2015, I think we've got some statistics here. There's over 215 different variants of ransomware and only 97 have some type of known fix to unlock it. Um, they use extremely strong encryption and pretty much are you know, the ones that have no remediations just aren't used anymore. Um, so you can see on this example of actual ransomware, um, how easy they make it for you to, you know, they have instructions how to buy Bitcoin, how to transfer them Bitcoin. There's even a tab, if you can see there, for chat support. If you are having issues with sending them the money, uh, you can chat with, I don't know who it would go to, but um, chat support. And so- A really nice criminal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Probably a very friendly person who you're about to send uh, 0.4 Bitcoin, which on this one is about 2,500. I think right now 0.4 um, would be about $5,000. Um, so they make it easy and they want you to pay the ransom, obviously, you know, and not try and get your information back on your own. And another way that they uh, try and pressure you into that is by having this countdown clock on here. So you have got basically three days until the price and the ransom doubles. Um, so they pressure you that way, try and make you, you know, if you don't have the ability to recover from a backup, um, in three days easily and get all your systems back online. You may be you know, thinking, should I pay the ransom? Should I not pay the ransom? Um, and I think, you know, it's obviously if you pay the ransom, you're incentivizing them to continue to uh, have more ransomware out there and it's a successful way to do it. But um, a lot of organizations do end up paying because they have no other way to recover their backups or um, get their information back um, and, you know, just have some downtime and lost revenues. And so they do pay the ransom. And I think some situations it's, it's not guaranteed that it works. Sometimes it does work. Sometimes it doesn't work, you know, so it's not, not guaranteed that way either. Um, you may just pay and still have all your information locked up. Um, I think the only other point here is, uh, that they do use Bitcoin or some type of cryptocurrency, which is pretty much the, the cash equivalent that can't be traced. You know, it's not like they're asking for a, a wire or anything. Um, it's the cash equivalent of a electronic money. Um, so it's very hard to trace that through to the account that it's going or, you know, where it ends up uh, once you send it. So that's kind of a tool that's allowed them the, the rise of those cryptocurrencies over the past you know, five years or so um, to, be able to successfully um, have more ransomware uh, software out there. I think we have another polling question on this slide as well. Yeah. All right, and we can talk about this one too. Um, yep. So after you pay the ransom and get your data back, if you're lucky, um, or sort of backup, your problem is most likely solved. See a lot of falses, which is probably the right answer here. Um, you definitely, yeah, it's, it's not solved even if you get your information all back. There's a lot of uh, probably forensic digging to see what happened, how they got in, um, how you should, what holes and vulnerabilities you should close up. Um, so definitely your problem is not solved. You likely have some significant issues uh, to still resolve there. Yeah, and I think some of the forensic, the cyber forensic teams that we work with um, uh, have also talked about some new types of ransomware that's out there where initially it would be launched and it would just randomly encrypt files. Some of the more sophisticated ransomware today and, and attackers actually getting on a network and then targeting the things that they're going to encrypt. So not only are they encrypting more important files, they mm -hmm. also get deeper in the network, potentially expose other data. So the the, the scope of that type of ransomware just changes the dynamic of what a business needs to do to recover, you know, beyond just restoring and recovering the data. Yeah, just like the uh, credential theft, it's more sophisticated and they're getting smarter and using it uh, to target you more specifically every time. All right. So this slide, I think, was just kind of a, an interesting one we wanted to share. Um, kind of prove a point that the 
uh, risk landscape, threat landscape is not getting better. You know, there's, these are real headlines from 2016, 17, 18, 19. I'm sure that there'll be one at the end of 2020 that it was the worst year for data breaches. Um, and, you know, every year, I guess, is the worst year and uh, it just keeps getting worse and worse. So I don't know, you know, there's not much we can do to slow that down other than um, maybe implementing some of the uh, recommendations we have for you guys um, towards the end of the couple slides here. But uh, it's, it's just kind of interesting to see how it's always the worst year for data breaches every <laughs> year after year. All right, so so we've covered a little bit about uh, what's the same, and a lot of that you've probably heard. But of course, there's always uh, changes to the, the threat landscape and and the techniques that the criminals are using. Uh, now we want to dive in a little bit to to what's changed, and a lot of this is being it's either being prompted by uh, our response to COVID, um, and it's also being prompted by just a natural progression. Um, to being more reliant on technology, working remotely, and a lot of other factors that, that were happening anyway. Um, so what's changed? Well, a few things. All right, first, the way we work has changed. And, and this is, a, um, it's hard to really pinpoint exactly how many people are working remotely, uh, both before uh, and after the response to COVID, and then also going forward. So what we have here is a study that looked at the amount of uh, the global workforce that could possibly work from home. So they have jobs where they can work remotely. Uh, and it, it looks to be about 60 million employees in the US could work from home at least part of the time. Uh, so taking that number, uh, they were, the study was able to estimate that uh, 25 to 30% of that, of that 60 million uh, will be working from home multiple days a week by the end of 2021. So this is a trend that's, that, that, that was happening. It will continue to happen. Uh, so not, not uh, you know, we don't have people in office buildings behind firewalls and security that we can protect. Now we have people accessing data really from wherever they are uh, on devices that we may or may not be able to control, uh, hoping that they're going to be following the best practices uh, that, that we outlined. So it, it, this, it, this, is probably one of the biggest uh, things that are introducing uh, new challenges for uh, the, the people that are defending against cybercrime and criminal activity. Uh, another polling question here. And this one asks about uh, when things go back to normal, uh, will a greater percent percentage of your workforce ro work remotely than before? Um, and, and it looks like as we're watching the results come in, the majority is true. So uh, again, it was a trend that was already happening. COVID and uh, the, the way that we're responding to it has accelerated it because we're finding that people, for the most part, uh, if you can work remotely, uh, people have been able to do it. They've been, been able to manage it well. And, and a lot of people uh, have found that it, that it works well. So this is a trend that's only going to continue. All right, so what are the implications of this? Uh, well, it changes, it changes the way we, we look at networking and, and it changes the way we look at security. So the rigid uh, network security best practices of yesterday, that is you have a, a network, it's at a physical location, you've got data on machines, maybe it's in a data center that's, uh, that's physically there. You can build your strong border around that, that data and the technology and you can keep people out and you can manage what people inside are doing. Uh, well, that, uh, that border uh, has been slowly evaporating uh, into the cloud uh, over time. And, and, and we're at a point now where it's, um, it's almost gone. So the border evaporates. Most of our data, the secure data that we're trying to protect uh, has now shifted from that on-premises data center to more of a cloud data center. So we've got uh, cloud applications that have replaced file servers. Most of us are using uh, a cloud-based email, email. Think of Office 365. Uh, if you've got any uh, customer relationship management, enterprise resource planning systems, a lot of that stuff is shifted to the cloud. So that, that data that's important to the business, those, those applications that enable the business to run are now in a cloud environment. And this, there's a lot of benefits here. Um, 
I think Phil mentioned early on that many businesses, especially small businesses, have an IT person and they manage everything from day-to-day -day, uh, break fix issues to security. So if you put your data in a cloud environment with a really uh, a good company, they're going to be better able, better uh, at security than you ever will. They've got teams of people doing it uh, as long as you're using a reputable source. However, what it does is it shifts risk. So not, uh, now you don't necessarily have to um, focus as much on securing the data uh, where it is at rest. So it's, it's in a cloud environment uh, there, uh, it, and you're using a reputable store, uh, a company and they're securing your data, that's, that's great. But now you've got the majority of your users working remotely. So look over here at the left part of the slide, accessing data from wherever they are. So this means that fancy firewall that has a lot of lights blinking on it in a, in a networking closet back at the office isn't necessarily protecting these employees working from home. Uh, what they're doing is they're using potentially a laptop that you gave them. Uh, they're using a laptop uh, that's their personal device, and you're hoping that the antivirus software on that and any other protections that you've installed are protecting them. And you're hoping that their router that they're using at home uh, has some security on it uh, and the way that they're accessing the internet. So essentially, they go, they go from their device through their access point, wherever that may be, to the public internet, and then back down to the cloud. Some organizations are using a VPN. VPNs were great um, and, and essential. They still are for many organizations. But what a VPN does is it allows you to tunnel through the cloud, so it's a private encrypted tunnel, back to uh, those data resources uh, you know, at a physical location. And it, and it enables, it allows you to, um, to, to route traffic through your protection. Uh, however, if employees are getting their get accessing cloud resources directly, they may not be going through the, the VPN. Um, as more and more resources shift away from on-premises to the cloud, that VPN becomes less and less uh, important because the scope of what it protects is less and less. So this is a major shift for many organizations. So how do you how do you secure uh, the data? How do you secure access? What becomes more important now when we're going through this change? And we're going to get into a lot of this in, in a little bit here uh, about the things that you can do to kind of make this shift with this environment. But the key here is that the way that we access data, the, the resources and the technology we use have changed. Uh, we can't use the traditional defense in depth strategy uh, and build, uh, you know, the protections in one physical location. We've got to think about uh, the users and access and passwords and all the other things that go along with it, in addition to picking the right vendors. If you pick a vendor that doesn't follow appropriate security practices and you're not auditing them and making sure that they're doing what they say, you could potentially have an issue there as well. All right. Uh, so, I, Go ahead, Phil. Um, so we've got a couple examples here uh, and basically wanted to highlight on this slide that the attackers are, you know, like Mike said earlier, they uh, leverage your fear and uncertainty, um, and they adapt very quickly to, you know, global situations or um, localized situations and try and capitalize to use that to take advantage. Um, we said earlier, email phishing is not new, you know, fraud is not new. Um, we're seeing a huge rise, though, in the number of uh, COVID-related email phishing examples. Um, this one here you know, is a pretty standard email. I think when uh, COVID was first rolling out, we got, you know, everyone was getting emails from literally any company that they ever bought anything from saying what they're doing to uh, respond to it. And, you know, CEOs were emailing their employees. So, you know, very likely email here um, with a Word document attachment that likely has a malicious file um, embedded in it. And, you know, the attackers can embed malicious files into Word documents, Excel, PowerPoint. So keep that in mind as you're, um, going through your emails just because it's a Word document doesn't mean that it's secure. Uh, and then we've got here a recent one um, with the state of Maryland, uh, fraudsters filing 47,500 unemployment claims in Maryland. Um, you know, with the unemployment rates increasing and the more and more claims being filed, uh, they basically took advantage of this, probably bought you know, social security numbers and information off the dark web um, I think you can buy a social security number on the dark web for a dollar. So I got a pretty good deal here if they get, you know, even one month's worth of checks from these 47,000 people. 
Um, I don't believe in Maryland. They're still kind of going through the investigation on that one. Um, I do know that the investigation has caused a freeze on some legitimate unemployed people to uh, are not getting their benefits currently, but um, hopefully they go through that quickly and uh, can get that resolved. Um, Maryland's not the only state either. I think Nevada had like a 200,000 um, claim fraud recently. You know, Ohio's had a fraud um, related to unemployment claims. So Maryland's not the only one. It's, it's become a, a pretty big issue um, that attackers are using to uh, you know, adapt and take advantage of this situation that we're in right now. All right, so like Mike said before, also increased reliance on third parties. Uh, we probably all have received some type of uh, message like this as well about um, your information being breached. It seems like they are more and more uh, common these days. I know I got one um, a couple of weeks ago from, I think it was our 401k plan provider, but it wasn't uh, actual breach to a, a criminal or anything, so that was fortunate. Um, the first one on the left here, Pivot, they're a managed service provider. Uh, we're seeing a lot more attacks targeting these managed service providers because um, their ability to actually run your whole IT environment remotely um, is you know, very easy these days with the speed of the internet and the remote access capabilities in the cloud. Um, a lot more people are leveraging managed service providers, um, but attackers are then realizing they can target them because if they, you know, say, I think with Pivot, there was uh, a ransomware associated with it and possibly some stolen uh, information. Um, if they can get ransomware on you know, the Pivot servers and they're hosting information for um, you know, all of their customers, their right, availability, but... the availability of their servers is you know, the most critical part of their business. So they're likely to respond and uh, may not have the, the speed to restore all of their customers from a backup um, and may respond and pay the ransomware. Um, so we're seeing a lot more related to managed service providers. Um, and the Blackball example here also, uh, just an uh, example we wanted to highlight from uh, people using cloud service providers. The attackers are really going and trying to target those cloud service providers um, because they, you know, instead of trying to get into one school and, and get data from one school, they can go and try and break into Blackbot and get data from thousands of schools uh, much easier uh, than trying to break into thousands of schools. So there's definitely a rise in this. Um, I don't think that we see kind of a, um, a breach with the bigger organizations, like if you're using a Amazon or a Google Cloud, um, there hasn't been anything significant from that standpoint, but some of these more medium-sized uh, to larger organizations that are providing cloud hosting or managed service providers are definitely being more frequently targeted now. Uh, Mike, I don't know if you wanted to add anything on just the cloud. Yeah, side. yeah. I, I think the key here is vendor due diligence. We, we have to use third parties. It makes a ton of sense. There's no reason to host a lot of this data yourself because these, these large companies are going to be better at it. Um, managed security service providers, good ones are really going to be the best solution rather than hiring the staff yourself. So we have to do this. So the key is to, to, um, to, to make sure you look at your agreements, make sure you have the protections in place. I'm, you know, coming from the insurance side, make sure your providers have the, the appropriate type of insurance that they can cover losses if something should go wrong. Um, and that the other thing from the insurance side is we're actually starting to see uh, a rise in insurance costs for folks like uh, managed security service providers because uh, the insurance claims are going up because the criminals are, are attacking those uh, type of organizations because they know that's their best bet. So yes, they have better security than we probably would on our own, but if you're getting targeted more, the likelihood potentially goes up. So it's a balance. Uh, and the advice here is not to, you know, go back to, uh, you know, everything uh, hosted in your data center. It's just to be smart about your providers and then be prepared when you get an, uh, a notification like this Blackboard one, this went out directly to uh, the organizations that were using the service, and then they had to figure out what they were going to tell their clients and, uh, and and customers. So it's thinking through what potentially could happen as you're making this shift to a more cloud versus on-premises infrastructure. Uh, the other important piece here is that many of us have crossed out plan A, which was working physically in an office, 
We're working on plan B, which many of us had to scramble to put together pretty quickly. Um, and we may not have a plan C. So the other issue here with third party providers is that the, the reliance on these providers is, is more and more than it really more than it ever was. And that's not going to go away. So making sure that you have contingencies and response plans uh, and, and a plan C if those things fail to maintain business is really important. And then with that, we also have another polling question here. And this one probably, we probably know where this one's going as well as your organization, <laughs> more or less relying on, relying on cloud applications and third party systems. Yeah, I don't think I've had any clients, uh, you know, build a huge data center in house recently or yeah. uh, bring anything in house that they can't just put in the cloud. Yeah. Uh, it's a lot more cost efficient and uh, operationally efficient. Mm -hmm. All right. Yeah, overwhelmingly more. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right. So. All right, next, next one here. Um, how do we manage cyber risk? So, the threats and the landscape we just kind of went through. We'll take a dive into what are some of the best practices to manage this. And I think uh, it is the similar way we did before with uh, a couple updates and some new things to consider. But um, overall, you know, if, I think if you look, you know, last year versus this year with the remote work versus just not, not the remote work, there's definitely some differences, um, but not a whole lot has changed. If you look back five years, 10 years, to 2020, there are significant changes. Uh, so I think that's just kind of important to keep in mind. If you're still running your IT and security, um, like it's 2015 or 2010, then there's probably some things you should change. But uh, last year to this year, and we'll go through some key focus points. All right, so first step in managing your cyber risk is to identify the weaknesses. Um, this, you know, a lot of, a lot of clients that we have go right to the point where they're trying to find the best uh, security tool to install or a uh, firewall to implement um, without actually understanding what their risk profile is. Um, if we, you know, if we're asking for, you know, let's see your data inventory, many clients don't even have that and can't even tell us what data they have, where all their data resides. So I think that's kind of an important first step is really just to get an understanding of um, and maybe to even start with a policy, come up with a data classification policy for what you have, uh, what you think you have from data and how you want to classify it. Um, then go to that step and actually perform an inventory, get an inventory of your data, as well as all of your technology, um, servers in the cloud, servers physically, um, networking devices, software, hardware, um, is really important to, to start from that level and get an understanding of what all it is um, from an asset standpoint that you have in place um, to be able to actually, from a risk standpoint then, uh, implement some of these other protections. Um, vulnerabilities, uh, your back door might be locked, but the window, or your front door might be locked, but the window in the back of the house is still open kind of thing. Um, it's really important to make sure that you're doing a, a full scale vulnerability assessment that includes, you know, external penetration test as well as the internal kind of audit phase, having someone run a, a fully uh, full scope um, assessment to identify all your vulnerabilities. Um, and to do that you know, frequently enough where if you are making changes and there will be new vulnerabilities that you're able to identify them and come up with an action plan. Uh, I think when you, you know, a lot of people hear about vulnerabilities, they jump immediately to technical ones or outdated systems or you know, running a Windows 2003 server, Windows XP computer. Um, the biggest risk vulnerability though is definitely people. And that's something that you need to consider and uh, I guess identify and also test as well. Um, similar to doing a vulnerability assessment or a penetration test, uh, doing a email phishing test, I think is one of the, the biggest and most important recommendations. Um, doing that, you know, we almost recommend doing it monthly because you just can't do it enough and take a sample of your employees, kind of divide them up and um, test it once a month, just a, a subset there. So you can get a good understanding of what your weakness really is. Um, we have uh, 
one client that has a policy where they actually don't even email internally at all. So if you get an email internally, it's most likely going to be spoofed. Um, they use Slack or like Teams to communicate internally strictly and would never send internal emails. Um, so that's kind of an interesting approach, but may not be you know, work for everybody. Um, and then I think also with kind of that people vulnerability thing, the, the training and awareness of it, um, it's really not enough to just show them how to hover over the link or look for a spoofed email address anymore because it's getting so sophisticated. Um, we've been kind of working with your know, security awareness training and things that we're doing to communicate that it's more of a, a mindset and getting and training the employees to uh, realize, is this a, an email that I would typically get? Um, not to react to emails um, and, and just to you know, look at it for from a holistic picture. And um, is this something that I would really even should be getting? Or is it uh, something that, you know, we, that probably is a spoofed email or a malicious email? Um, strategy and governance too, also very important, taking pretty much everything from the data, technology, vulnerabilities, as well as all your policies, procedures, and performing and doing a more of a comprehensive security risk assessment, um, you know, communicating that with all the stakeholders and figuring out what your total overall risk is, um, is really important from the identification process. All right, and this, I think, uh, this next slide, so this is kind of what Phil alluded to in the beginning. So the, the, the way that the, the tactical protections that we have in place have evolved and will continue to evolve. Uh, what has stayed the same is really this, this, uh, this framework, the way that we have to approach managing cyber risk. The, the individual things in each of these categories may, are gonna continue to update, um, but if you're focusing on continually uh, updating your strategy in each of these five categories, this is based on the NIST cybersecurity framework. Uh, it, this is going to help you keep up. And, and cybersecurity, unfortunately, is not something that, that's static. It's something that you have to continue to work at. Uh, and there's probably no better example of that right now than uh, protections. Uh, so yes, the strategy here is very similar to what it was before uh, we were all working remotely. The tactical protections are definitely changed. Uh, so best of need protections, and we're going to talk about this in a, a little bit later as well. Um, you can have the most su expensive, sophisticated technology, but if it's if it's not protecting your actual um, your 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 actual um, attack surface. So think of in premises people sitting in an office versus people sitting at home working remotely. Those expensive protections uh, aren't helping you. Uh, so we need to shift from best of breed or the most sophisticated really to the best of need. And the only way you can come up with that best of need is if you start at the identify phase, which was Phil was talking about, what do you have? Where's your data? How are people working? If you don't do that well, it's really hard to do protections well. Going right along with that detecting. So protections are great. Uh, a lot of the technology that we're using today has, has come a long way and there's some really cool stuff out there that's actually affordable. Um, so people can actually implement it, uh, but but the technology isn't enough, and Phil hit on this enough. Uh, you know, people are, are still going to be an issue, uh, unless you're like that organization that can stop using email. People have to use email uh, unless you disable the functionality of it. It's an attack vector, so things are going to happen. Uh, so we need to have ways to detect when something goes wrong, uh, and this is more than. Um, uh, you know, malware getting through, this is now looking at behavior and access and, and what's normal and what's not normal. So yes, um, detection was always important. How we do it now is a little bit different. Um, we mentioned third parties before, there's risks of doing it, but you can also automate and outsource this detection piece, which is recommended if you don't have the capabilities to do it in-house. And then finally, we'll, we'll end with, or we'll, we'll close out this part with the uh, response and recovery. So this is an area in my experience, and Phil, you might have similar experience, where um, unfortunately businesses haven't had a lot of, had, had, had a lot of cases where they're dealing with cyber incidents. So they're coming up with their incident response and recovery strategies in the moment during a breach, which is the worst time to do it. So if nothing else, sit down with your team after this, um, talk to your clients about what they're doing, uh, what would their plan would be to respond and recover from an incident. The response is immediate. So something's hit today, Who's on the team? Who's helping us make decisions? 
what's important, uh, what are the regulatory and compliance issues that we need to deal with, how do we stop this from spreading, how do we get it off the network, all of these things are complicated in a, in a normal, uh, stable environment. It becomes even more difficult during, during an actual breach. So think about this stuff now. A lot of the stuff you're going to have to bring in third parties to help you with. So also think about that, like who's the legal provider that's going to help you figure out what the uh, laws and, and regulations you're going to need to comply with. Who, who is that going to be? Uh, forensics, cyber forensics is difficult. Who, who are the providers uh, that you're going to work with? Uh, and then getting back up and running. Uh, how, are you gonna, how are you going to recover? How are you going to get those systems back? How are you going to get the data back? How are you going to recover your reputation? These are all things that you should think about before you have an incident as best you can. Uh, and, and this is, you know, any plan that you come up with here uh, is great when it's, when it's sitting, uh, you know, on a drive someplace. Uh, when you implement it, things are going to go wrong. But having no plan at all is is really not the strategy right now. Yeah, and hopefully don't keep it on just one drive or something electronically that uh, could get uh, locked out by ransomware or uh, not available if uh, you do have an incident. Absolutely, yeah. Print it out, maybe. I'm not a fan of printers, but hey, this is an <laughs> this is a use where you might be able to. to Cloud's to, always good too. Yeah. All right, another poll question here. All right, we kind of, we've already hit on this. Uh, so can I effectively outsource my cyber risk if I use cloud applications or third parties to store any confidential or sensitive data? And I'll talk through this kind of as we're going through it here. Um, so again, you can shift risk. So you can shift the protections and a lot of the heavy lifting to a cloud service provider for the protections, but now you've got to worry about users and access control. Same thing goes for data. So if you are a data owner, so if you collect that data um, and then you put it in a local server that's at a physical location, if it's breached, your liability is potentially the same as if it's breached in a cloud service. That individual or, or consumer or customer that gives you the data, uh, just because you put it in a cloud service, they're going to still potentially come, for, come after you uh, if there's a lawsuit. And then many times, the legal uh, responsibility to notify lays with the data owner, not necessarily where that data is hosted. And a lot of times there's negotiations. If the breach happens because of a cloud service provider failure, they may notify, but the legal liability does lay with the data, data owner in, in most cases. So it's a tricky one. Um, most people got this fall, but it's, you know, it, it, this is a tricky one and it also depends on the uh, exact use cases. All right. Okay, we're getting up here towards the end. All right. Um, so taking a closer look at your remote workforce, uh, I think when you know, everyone was kind of forced to pretty rapidly move to a remote workforce, um, and now you know that it's been a couple months, uh, it's time to definitely time to go back if you haven't yet and reassess the risks and security of the remote workforce and the remote employees. Um, it's you know, one of the biggest things that we have right now and are all these uh, organizations that allow just, you know, remote desktop access right into these uh, desktops in, in the offices and didn't really secure that. Um, we had one organization that allowed the individuals to actually bring home their desktops to their houses and plug them in and use them there. And, uh, you know, those are probably not, uh, you know, don't have the same level of security that a traditional laptop or mobile device would. They probably don't have full disk encryption on a, on a desktop that's at someone's house now. And since it's outside the office, it's really becoming a, a mobile device. So we got to go back and kind of address some of these questions here. Um, who is permitted to connect remotely? You know, do you have a, a policy in place, formal approvals, a periodic review that you're doing of those users and make sure that they're still all appropriate and necessary? Um, what are they permitted to access? Um, obviously still use a least privilege model and maybe even your, you know, data classification policy that you just wrote up from that. Identify, uh, slide a couple back and kind of you know, and define what they are permitted to access. If it's applications or specific data, you may not want data being accessed remotely. Um, if it is highly sensitive, uh, what are they permitted to connect remotely? This is a, someone that's a little bit more difficult to kind of determine. Um, I think people are working all hours these days and it's a little bit more flexible, but you may have some employees that do only you know, need to connect remotely for a specific shift or purpose. Uh, and where are they allowed to connect from? 
um, location is uh, one of the bigger risks with this remote workforce. I think people are um, you know, trying to use the fact that they can wor work from anywhere. But if you have an employee who you know, maybe somehow flew to China or somewhere uh, out of the country um, to live with their family while everyone's working remotely, do you really want them connecting from there you know, to, through to your VPN or back into your uh, company data? So you got to consider that. Um, how will employees connect? Uh, we'll cover this one uh, in some more detail on the next slide. So connectivity, uh, multi-factor required for any type of remote access. Uh, definitely cannot stress that enough. If you are just using a username and password and that's how you're getting in you know, across to a cloud service or um, on your, onto your VPN or into your network uh, when you're remote, that, you know, that's a huge risk right there. You should always be using multi-factor authentication for any type of remote connection. Um, the, there's you know, a lot of apps and things out there. Those are great for multi-factor uh, and you don't need to actually issue hardware tokens anymore, um, but definitely cannot stress that enough. Remote access should always be multi-factor. Um, we'll talk about some of the uh, password implications on the next slide, but um, just wanted to stress that there. Uh, encryption always important. Uh, we can get into some specifics here, but I probably won't on the level of encryption that's needed, but just using a unencrypted uh, cloud service or unencrypted VPN um, should not be using that. Uh, only those time frames we talked about. So there's kind of the next two sections down here, company issued devices versus BYOD. With the, the rapid rate that everyone had to go remote, um, there was a lot of BYOD that organizations didn't have policies for. And that becomes very risky when you're just letting employees use their home computers to remote in through your remote desktop or through Citrix or whatever it may be. And there's a lot of security risks with that. Um, they may have the ability to then save files down to their home computer or print something from their home computer um, off the network. So a lot of risks there. We always recommend using company issued devices um, if you know, budgets and resources allow for it, because uh, you can do things like hard drive encryption, application whitelisting, and have the endpoint protections and antivirus and all that already installed on the device. And it's much easier to manage. So recommend BYOD only uh, if you have it, you know, thoroughly thought out and controls implemented, not ideal for a reactionary, uh, reactionary purposes. All right, um, protections against credential theft. Uh, I could talk about passwords probably for a whole other hour if we wanted to. Um, passwords are something that's uh, always a hot topic. Everyone hates when you increase the length of passwords and have to remember 50 million passwords, but um, we don't have, we're not at the point yet, which I'm not sure why. Our computers and everything is not you know, using biometrics like our phone does. You know, with the phones and iPads or whatever, you can set it up and I don't have to really type in any passwords on my phone ever. It just looks at my face and stores them all. Um, so until we get there with uh, laptops and desktops and actual work computers, um, you will still have to use passwords. Make sure you have a policy and that that policy is enforced. Uh, password managers are good devices to use and good tools. Um, I would say that maybe don't use them for your most sensitive or critical data to get access to it. You wouldn't want to use um, and store your password unless it's you know extremely well encrypted for all of your administrator access or things like that, um, or to your, your bank information. Um, but they are good to use. You know we allow it here at CLA for not for accessing our client data system, but for anything you know on a website or um, easier or less lower risk things there. Um, Change often. This one uh, kind of can be talked about from two um, standpoints. The industry guidance on passwords changes very often. Um, it used to be, you know, eight characters as long as you had some dollar signs and symbols in there, you were going to be secure. And then it was go to pass phrases or longer ones, and then they were people were saying that nobody could remember that, so they just wrote all their passwords down on a sticky note under their keyboard. Um, so the, the, I guess the standards have changed and 
very frequently? And should you actually change your password frequently? Um, I think there's some guidance out now around not changing passwords. And I mean, that I can see where that's coming from because when we do uh, penetration tests or vulnerability assessments, things like that, the number one way we get in is by using the password summer 2020. You know, it meets the requirements, got a capital, it's got a number, uh, letter, and you can change it every 90 days with the season and just put the year in there. Um, that I think is almost always seen at large organizations. Somebody's using the password summer 2020. So getting away from that and using, if you can make like a 15 character long password um, that still uses some maybe dictionary words, but not necessarily summer 2020, like the month in, or the season in the year um, can be very effective. Uh, but with that, you want to make sure that they are not using weak passwords like password, 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 or something like that um, and do a, like an actual audit of the passwords where you'd hire someone to try and crack your employee's password to see if they're weak or compromised previously. Um, so a lot there to cover with passwords, but well, I, I would say longer is more secure um, and you can use password managers, but uh, maybe not for your most sensitive and critical information. All right, so I, 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 we touched on this earlier, best of need protection and detection technology. So this is where things are shifting. Um, so uh, I, I guess the, the, the key takeaways here are that uh, endpoints are more critical than ever. And when we talk about endpoints, it's the computers that your folks are using wherever they are. So it's probably that laptop that's, that's sitting at home with the user or it's the phone uh, where they've been able to download access to their uh, cloud applications. Antivirus is really important. It blocks the known threats. But, the, but it's no longer sufficient to really protect those devices because there's behavioral type things um, that, that antivirus doesn't look for. So somebody could compromise an account and it's not gonna catch it with antivirus. So there has to be layered protections uh, around those, those individual devices. And there's some really great technology coming out um, that brings a lot of the firewall technology that, that we're so used to in a physical environment uh, actually down directly to devices. So this is a big shift in the technology uh, landscape and it's, it's making it easier for businesses to, to keep up. Um, outsourcing, we already mentioned this, there's, there's benefits of outsourcing, uh, the detection and protection. Uh, there's also drawbacks because again, you risk those, uh, those businesses that you outsource, you risk them getting hit and then it affecting you. Uh, but the reality is uh, here is if, you, if you're using a good trusted partner to help with this, uh, they're probably gonna be able to do it better than you are and it's easier to hire them than to try to find somebody to do it on your own. So whether it's a managed security service provider, there's also managed detection response providers that look, that, that really bolster just your detection. Um, and again, this stuff's getting a lot more affordable. Um, and then look, keep an eye out for new technology. There's a lot of really cool new things like machine learning or an artificial intelligence that again, look for the behavioral uh, uh, issues rather than uh, the signature based kind of static defenses. Um, so we're not really going to give you specifics here um, other than um, uh, think about the best of need. And again, it all goes back to the assessment. What are you doing? How are you doing it? What data are you accessing? Then how do you secure it? But I would bet most of us today um, should look more closely at those endpoints and the users rather than spending a lot of money on technology that sits in a, in a physical location. Um, the other thing is, is cyber insurance is really helpful. Um, and it aligns really well with an incident response plan. Um, so uh, I mentioned creating an incident response plan before. I think it's really important. Um, but what I, what I want to quickly kind of end here with is that how cyber insurance would work with uh, uh, help an organization work through this, even if they don't have one. Um, so insurance doesn't detect incidents, but it, also, but it does help establish uh, severity thresholds, and it gives you people to talk to. I think the be biggest benefit of, of insurance, cyber insurance these days is that if you have an issue, you can, you can immediately talk to a data privacy attorney that deals with this stuff every day that can give you guidance to say, hey, does this, does this meet the threshold for us to take the next step? You're not coming up with that in a vacuum and you're using external people to help you that do this every day. Uh, insurance gives you direct access to that. Um, insurance isn't gonna build your incident response team, but it comes, uh, every insurance policy will connect you directly with legal, forensics, public relations, incident response, um, uh, to help you contain or remove, uh, you know, malware if it's on a device. Uh, so even if you haven't come up with this ahead of time, you kind of get pushed along in the right process uh, through these policies. Um, Pre-approved vetted providers, 
Uh, there's so many providers uh, out here today providing uh, all sorts of different types of services. Uh, what insurance does is they actually vet them. Uh, they they um, negotiate rates, so you're not going to get gouged uh, during a time of crisis. Uh, and um, it, it makes sure that you're experienced people that are dealing with this every day. Um, many po uh, uh, policies will also provide access to incident handlers and, and forensics. Um, and incident response are very different. Forensics is going to help you figure out what happened, how it happened, um, the scope and scale of it. Incident handlers are, are kind of like the fire department. They're going to come in and, and they're going to help put the fire out, uh, make sure that you know the ransomware is not spreading to other parts of the network, make sure it's contained, and make sure you can actually get into a stable environment to do that, that investigation. Uh, very important uh, for incident response. Um, and then finally, it helps uh, recover. Um, Right now, what we're dealing with uh, is, is businesses getting hit with this kind of thing, whether it's social engineering or ransomware, and it's the first time that they've ever dealt with it. Responding isn't cheap, uh, so these are unexpected costs. Uh, if you're not prepared to deal with them, uh, it, it, it could be really uh, difficult right now. Uh, so making sure that you either have a reserve fund to, to deal with this kind of thing, um, making sure that you have the right insurance, making sure you know what the deductible is that you're going to be out of pocket, all of this is really important to think about now rather than when it happens. Uh, and what I've got over here on the right-hand side is, is the high-level essential elements that you need to consider when thinking about incident response. So it's detecting an incident, um, engaging with an incident response team to help coordinate your response, bring in legal early on. The reason you bring in legal is because they're going to actually coordinate the response, essentially your quarterback, to help you respond. Um, and anything that you tell them, anything that they pull in with the investigation is covered under attorney-client privilege. So if you are pulled into a lawsuit or regulatory investigation, uh, anything that you uh, work through your lawyer with will be protected. So if you start running out and doing this on your own and telling people what you have a, a major breach, um, none of that's protected. If you funnel it through a, a lawyer, uh, it is, including forensics. So they're actually going to bring in the forensics investigator and that um, – the report they come, they come back with is, is going to be a privileged work product. Um, contain and eradicate, make sure that the, you know, anything that's on a network isn't spreading, um, and then you have to recover, and then think about lessons learned so it doesn't happen again. Uh, so I guess this is kind of an appropriate place to end. Uh, this is really the tail end of what you would deal with if you did have an incident. Uh, hopefully this has been helpful today, uh, gave you either you some things you can think about with your own organization, or maybe some things you could potentially share with a client. Um, if you have any questions for us, um, we're out of time. We're about three minutes over as it is. Um, but here's our contact information. We'd be happy to, to hop on a call or respond to email. Um, anything that, that uh, you, know, you didn't share here that, that you'd like to talk about, feel free to reach out. Um, I, we can, I mean, I can stick around too if there's any other questions. I saw one come in um, uh, asking if we have a checklist on where to start. Um, and I am not sure on a checklist per se because it does get very specific i mean i'd say definitely take these slides and start with the uh the nist framework make sure you've got policies procedures for identify protect detect uh respond and the fifth one um, but i would say take these slides and start there um or yeah. chat to us if and we can help find you something a little bit more specific Any other questions? Well, thank you for joining everyone. I will be sending out um, Mike and Phil's information as well as a copy of the slide deck and the recording is also available upon request. So um, thanks again for joining us and I hope to see you next month. Thank you everyone. Thank you.